do you know about inverse functions that you didn't know before? You don't like them. Opposite. Opposite, that's a good word. Could you elaborate what you mean by opposite? Well, what? <laughs> What does that mean to be the opposite of a function? Corey? The input and the output switch. What else about inverses? That's it. We learned one thing. Solve for X. Okay. Yeah. So it's like um, solve for the other variable. Right, so instead of y equals a bunch of stuff with x's in it, you solve for the x. We're actually going to do that a, a bunch in today's class. Yes, yep, so um, when you do everything in reverse order, um, it undoes. Yeah. Yep, so if, that means that when you compose them, if you do f of f inverse, when you run the two machines in succession, you get the same input back out. And you can do it in either order. You can put it through f inverse first, then through f, and you get the x back. No matter what x you use, if you run it through each machine, then you get x back. All right, so those are good. That's a pretty good summary. So if this is my F machine and this is my F inverse machine, then if I drop an X into F and I get Y, then I'm going to take that Y, whatever that output is, and put it into F inverse. What should I get out? X. Good. It's a round trip. All right, so if f of x is going to be 3x plus 4, what is f of 2? 10. Yeah, you just plug in a 2. 3 times 2 plus 4 is 10. What's f inverse of 10? Quick, no calculations. Thank you. Okay, so how did you get it so fast? Yeah, because you know, you know that f and f inverse make a round trip. So if you put a 2 into f and you get a 10, then when you put a 10 into f inverse, you should get the 2 back. So that one we were able to do quick, no calculations. What if I want to know f inverse of 31? What? Plug in. Yeah, we're trying to figure out what to plug in to get 31 as the output. Subtract 4 and divide by 3. Yeah. So, um, yeah, or I could just, if my function is f of x equals 3x plus 4, this 31 is an input into f inverse, which means it's an output for f. So I can replace my output here with a 31 and solve for what input would get me that. So to solve this equation, you subtract 4 and divide by 3. So some people jumped right to like the undo part. Um, 
when you solve an equation, you are exactly undoing what was done to x. So we get x equals 9. So if I wanted to do this in general, find an inverse for a, a random input, f inverse of something, how do I find it? I'm going to follow the same approach that I used for f inverse of 31, except this time I'm not sure what the output is. It's some unknown output y. And I want to know what x I should use to get it. So I'm just going to solve this thing for x. And I get y minus 4 over 3. So this is how we figure out, in general, the formula for f inverse. This is a little weird to us to look at this formula, because it's so ingrained in us that x should be the independent variable and y the dependent variable. It looks really weird to have x equals. So we just redefine the variables to make it what we like. So we say, well, instead of x equals, I'm going to say, well, f inverse of some input. So I'm just going to let the input be x now. That would be x minus 4 over 3. My inverse function is x minus 4 over 3. Now, those two functions should undo each other. Let's just pick a test point. So a test x value. f of x is 3x plus 4. f inverse of x is x minus 4 over 3. Somebody pick an x value. OK. So if I do f of 2, plug that in here, I get 10. If you take that 10 and plug it into our formula for f inverse, we get 10 minus 4 over 3, which is the 2. We get the 2 back. So it does happen that the formula we came up with is the inverse function. So we just found an inverse function without me telling you how to do it, right? without me giving you a step-by-step. -step. We just kind of figured out how to do it. But we do have a step-by-step -step procedure if you like that kind of thing. So first thing, I have the list of things to do to find it on the left. And we're going to go through an example as we read them on the right. All right, so first and foremost, check that your function is one-to-one. -one, because if it's not one-to-one, -one, don't even bother, right? It doesn't have an inverse function. So how should I check that the square root of x cubed minus 8 is 1 to 1? Yeah, good. We'll graph it and use the vertical and horizontal line test. OK, so graph that appears to pass both the vertical and horizontal line test. Okay, so seems good. OK, so next, replace f of x with a y. That was our first step when we were just doing the line. Down here, we replaced f of x with y. Just a simpler notation to work with, really, means the same thing. So I'm going to have y equals the square root of x cubed minus 8. All right, then step 3 says swap the x's and the y's. Make the y's x's and the x's y's. When we did this without a step-by-step -step list, we saved this step until the very end. Right? You can do it in either order. So we solved the equation, then swapped the x's and the y's. You can do it before or after. It doesn't matter. So I'm going to make the y's x's and the x's y's. So I get x equals the square root of y cubed minus 8. 
and then I want to solve this new equation for y. Okay, and when I do that, I am precise I'm generating the steps that undo what f did. So how do I get y by itself here? How do I undo what's being done to y? What's you, there's a square root here. To undo it, I should square. Yep, so I'm going to square both sides. Okay, so on the left, x squared. And on the right, the square root and the square cancel. And I just get y cubed minus 8. All right, now what? Add 8 to both sides. So I have y cubed is x squared plus 8. And finally, cube root. So y is the cube root of x squared plus 8. And the very last step, replace y with f inverse of x. So that's how you find an inverse function. Replace f of x with y, interchange the x's and y's, solve the new equation for y, replace y with f inverse. Then we should be able to check to see if we're right. I'm just going to do a quick check um, by picking a number for x and seeing that I get the round trip. So what if I do f of, let's pick a good value for f, um, 2. What's f of 2? It's 0, yeah. So when you go to your original equation, f, plug in a 2, you get the square root of 2 cubed minus 8, which is square root of 0 or 0. All right, so f of 2 is 0, then f inverse of 0 should give me what? Two. So let's check and make sure that the formula we came up with gives me 2. So if I plug in a 0 in here, I get the cube root of 0 squared plus 8. That's the cube root of 8, which is 2. So we do have a round trip. For one, one particular x, we have a round trip. In general, you should check this for every x by composing the two functions. Well, you have you have two formulas, so let's do let's do um, f of f inverse. Okay, so formula for f inverse was the cube root of x squared minus eight, and then I'm going to take that formula, plug it into the formula for f, which was the square root of x cubed x cubed plus 8, right? But now I'm going to cube this thing. Yeah. So <laughs> this is the, this thing that I just wrote down is the formula for f, but I replaced x with the formula for f inverse. Because I'm trying to show that when I plug in any x, I get x out. So I showed it for 1x. I showed it for x equals 2. Right. I'm just checking my work. Checking. The, the way you show that two functions are inverses is if you compose them and you always get x back. All right. So now if I simplify what's over here. Oh, yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, good. All right, so when I'm simplifying this, I have a cube root and a cube. Those immediately cancel. 
So what I'm left with is the square root. My cube root and my cube cancel, and I have x squared plus 8 minus 8. Plus 8 minus 8 cancel. You get the square root of x squared, which is x. Okay. So we, show, we showed that our work has to be correct. Revel in a job well done. So the question yeah. would be what? what um, it, oh, so like on a quiz or a test, I could say um, question one, consider this function, right? And then I would say question part A is find the inverse of this function. And you get the formula we got down here. And then part B could be compose the function I gave you and the function you got to show that they really are inverses. It would, it would walk you through it. So here's an example. Um, the value of a car x years after it's purchased is given by v of x is 20,000 minus 2,000x. Two, we want to find the inverse function and explain its significance. So let's look at the actual function v first. What are its inputs? Years, yep. Yeah. Time in years since purchase. And my outputs? What does is, what is, um, that function calculate? Value. In dollars. Okay, so if I want to find the inverse function, Start by writing it down, the actual function. And I'm going to go through my six-step procedure, whatever it was, to find the inverse. Replace v of x with a y. Swap the x's and the y's. Solve for y. So I guess um, I'll subtract 20,000 from both sides. Equals negative 2,000y. And then divide both sides by negative 2,000. So I'm going to do y equals 20,000 minus x divided by positive 2,000. And then last step, replace y. It's okay. Um, in general, yeah, the, you, when you, the order you do subtraction in does matter. But if I do, for example, um, what does that come out to? I took the negative sign off the denominator. Yeah. Yeah. So this comes out to 4 over negative 2, which is negative 2. So if you switch the subtraction order, 6 minus 10, now my numerator is negative 4, so make the denominator positive 2. And you get the same answer. All right, so my last step, replace y with v inverse.
What are the inputs for V inverse? The values, yeah, because the inputs for V inverse are the outputs from V. So V inverse has as its inputs values and its outputs. time and years. So V will tell you how long you have to wait until your car reaches a certain value. So let's say you decide I'm not, not trading in my car until it's worth nothing. I don't know why you would do that. But you say I'm not trading it in until it's worth zero dollars you could plug into this function a zero for x and see how long it will take. How long will it take? Till your car is worth nothing. 10 years. Let's plug in a zero for x. You get 20,000 over 2,000, which is 10. So for sketching a graph of an inverse function, we, can, we should be able to do this even if we don't find a formula, because we know that the ordered pairs on f inverse are just the ordered pairs on f, but with the x and the y swapped, because that's what an inverse function does. It changes the inputs and the outputs. Okay, so if here's a graph of f inverse, oh sorry, this is a graph of f and I want to sketch f inverse. Just list a few nice points on the graph of f. So like, pick a few that go right through grid points. And then maybe I'll go a couple negatives too. So I've got negative 2, 1 fourth, negative 1, 1 half, 0, 1, 1, 2. 3, 4, and, oops, 1, 2, 2, 4, and 3, 8. Okay, so then I'm going to list the corresponding points that are on F inverse. You just swap the X and the Y. So I have 1 fourth, negative 2, 1 half, negative 1, 1, 0, 2, 1, 4, 2, and 8, 3. And I'm going to plot my new points, connect the dots with a nice smooth curve, and see what it looks like. So 1 fourth, negative 2, 1 half, negative 1, 1, 0, 2, 1, 4, 2, and 8, 3. Nice smooth curve. So what do you notice about F and F inverse? How are they related graphically? Yeah, it's a reflection. Yeah, they're reflections of each other and the mirror, right? the reflections over the line y equals x. So they're symmetric about the line y equals x. If we were to fold the, my grid paper on that line, the two graphs would lie on top of each other. All right, so from our, our previous example that we found the inverse of, let's find its domain. What values of x am I allowed to plug into that function?
You can't plug one in. Okay, so that's good. So that's a good start. If I plugged two in, that'd be fine. Yeah, I can plug two in because I'll get zero, and less than that I can plug in. Yeah, so you can kind of just think it through by testing and go, oh, I've gotten too big, I can only plug in smaller numbers. Or we could do it algebraically and say, well, my only restriction is that I have a square root, right? So whatever's under that square root, x cubed minus 8, has to be bigger than or equal to 0. And then I could solve this inequality. Right? And I would say, well, x cubed has to be bigger than or equal to 8, which means x... I'm sorry. Yeah, bigger than or equal to... So... Yeah, but it's not. It's less than or equal to 2, right? Bigger, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so my domain is bigger than or equal to 2. That is 2 to infinity. So you have a nice algebraic way of finding domain, usually. What about range? I want to know what kind of outputs that function is going to give me. Zero to infinity. Can you explain how you knew that? It just goes up, yeah. So if you plug in 2, the smallest x value that you're allowed to, you get a 0 as your output. And then you plug in anything else, like, say, I don't know, 3. 3 cubed is 27, minus 8 is 19, the square root of 19 is some positive number. So no matter what value I plug in bigger than 2, I'm going to get something bigger. So my range is going to be 0 is the smallest possible output and then they just get bigger from there. And if that kind of stumped you, you could always graph it and look at where, on what x and y values this function lives. So I'm going to do a little bit of a different window. Negative 1, oops. So we look at this function, and it looks like x equals 2 is the first value where the function lives. And it's just, it's not quite graphing this last little bit, but it does exist. And so the smallest value we know is 0 from algebra, from algebra, and then the y values just get bigger. All right, so given that, here are three graphs. One is f of x, which is the square root of x cubed minus 8. One is f inverse of x, the inverse function that we found of this guy earlier in class. And one is the line y equals x. See if you can figure out which graph is which. All right, so y equals x is pretty easy. You should be able to recognize it as the only line in the picture. And then... When we think about domain and range, right, I just found the domain and range of, of f. The domain was 2 to infinity. Those are the x values where the graph lives. And the range is 0 to infinity. So that would be this one. It lives on x values from 2 to infinity and y values from 0 to infinity. And we just graphed it on our graphing calculator, and that's what it looked like. So that means that this last one has to be f inverse. But what's the problem with that function being f inverse? Yeah, there's a problem with the reflection. So, so if I ignore the part over here, the reflection's perfect, right? But I have this extra stuff, which causes another problem. Besides making the, the reflection imperfect,
it doesn't pass the horizontal line test, which means it doesn't have an inverse. But it does have an inverse. It's f. f inverse is the inverse of f, so f is the inverse of f inverse. That was crazy. So the way we remedy this is when we found the formula for f inverse, which was um, x squared plus h cube rooted, we should also say comma for x is bigger than or equal to 0. So we explicitly give the domain, restrict the domain to just x is bigger than or equal to 0. That means that we get rid of all of this, get rid of the negative x's. Then the reflection is perfect. And f inverse passes the horizontal line test. Yep, you would um, you would look at the graphs. That was one way you could know it. The other way you could know it is that we made actually a little bad move back here when we were verifying that these two things were inverses, composing them, because it turns out that the square root of x squared doesn't equal x. Yeah, it equals plus or minus. Well, actually, it equals the absolute value of x. Yeah. yeah. So let me just do a little demonstration to show you why that's true. So if I make a table of values, x and the square root of x squared, and I'm going to plug some values in and see what I get. So if I plug in, say, um, a 2 for x, into this expression, I get 2 squared, which is 4, square rooted is 2, right? And if I plug in a, a 4, I get 4 squared is 16, square rooted is 4. If I plug in a 5, I get 5 squared is 25, square rooted is 5. So, so far, it looks like x and the square root of x squared are in fact equal, right? But what if I do this? If I plug in a negative 3 here, negative 3 squared is 9. What's the square root of 9? 3. So x and the square root of x squared are not the same. Right? And maybe I'll just do one more. I could do like negative 6, right? If I take negative 6 and square it, I get 36. Square rooted, I get 6. So this table of values that I made looks like what function? Absolute value, yeah. So the square root of x squared is actually the absolute value of x. And the absolute value of x equals x when? Only if x is bigger than or equal to 0. So we should have known earlier that we needed a restriction on the x's. But luckily, there's more than one way to see that you might need a restriction. You can look at the graph. You can, um, you might get it out of the your check. Probably, yeah. With squaring is the most most common occurrence. Okay, so. That finishes up um, lecture 26. So we have an activity. You can um, stay and do a few. I'll come around and help. You know, make sure you're comfortable. And when you do feel comfortable with with the material, you're free to go.